Hi class and welcome back for module 10. In module 9 we told you all about the bad guys who are competing with you for your garden and the produce that you're growing. In module 10 we're going to tell you about your allies, the good guys who are there to help you. And we'll also tell you how you can make your garden more pollinator friendly. So what we're going to tell you about in this module are the beneficial organisms. Now of course, when we're talking about beneficial, we're talking about it's beneficial to us as humans and to us as gardeners. They're normally referred to as beneficials, just like that, um, but technically the correct grammar would be a beneficial organism. But we're gonna call them beneficials probably from here on out. So the beneficials in, in agriculture, those are uh, insects, arachnids, animals, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, fungi, anything that helps you in your garden to be more successful. And this includes uh, pollinating crops, uh, producing useful products, killing harmful organisms, even recycling the waste that goes into the garden, and maintaining soil health. So insects, spiders, predatory mites, and other arthropods, these are considered beneficial when they eat arthropods that we humans consider undesirable in the garden. You know, the nice thing about it is that over 97% of those arthropods, insects, and other things like that that we see in our garden are either beneficial or are just innocent bystanders who happen to be in the garden. So the majority of insects that we see aren't there to harm the garden or to harm us. So keep that in mind whenever you're going through your garden. You know, make a careful observation before you start swacking and whacking and stomping on things. Make sure it's something that you actually really want to get rid of. And so managing our yards as habitat for beneficials is a great way to minimize our pest problems and to help eliminate pesticide usage. Now, the beneficials can be broken down into three broad categories, and we're going to go through these one at a time. The first category are the predators. And the predators, those are the organisms that capture any other organisms, like mites and insects, and devour those and help to get rid of those out of our garden. Now, the predators include spiders and mites and nematodes and other insects, and there are over a hundred families that contain predaceous species that are either predaceous as adults, as immatures, or both. So we're gonna start with the spiders. Spiders that we observe during the day, they're not likely to cause us any harm. The majority of spiders aren't out there to hurt us. So keep that in mind. Don't run from spiders every time you see them. And most of those that do cause problems, like the brown recluse and the black widow spider, those tend to stay hidden and away during the day because they, they like to be out of the way. Now, spiders, remember, they're not insects, they're arachnids. That means they have eight legs instead of six, and they have two body parts rather than three, the way the insects do. And the spiders will vary by their body shape, by their web type, by the way they hunt, and by the way their eyes are arranged on their head. And we're not gonna go into spider classification, but those are just some things to remember when you're, you're observing the spiders. Because there are some broad categories that you may be interested in just noting which ones you have in your garden. <clears throat> now, all spiders are predators, and the majority of spiders do feed on insects that they trap in their webs. And uh, jumping spiders and wolf spiders, those guys are actually active hunters. They go out seeking their prey, unlike the web spinners. And these spiders have really, really good vision so that they can see and uh, detect prey when it's near them. And it's been reported that they can tell a prey approaching up to 18 feet away. And crab spiders, those are uh, another commonly encountered group, and those ambush their prey. They lie in wait 
for the prey to come near them and then attack and devour it. Now here are some pictures of some spiders that you may observe in your garden. Uh, we've got several representatives here. I love this one. This is a really large spider, the black and yellow garden spider. And oftentimes you'll walk into its web before you see it. <laughs> so it can be a little annoying, but remember, they're good guys. So don't get uh, destructive right away. And the, the, uh, the garden spider and the um, orb weaver spider we have over here, you can tell a lot of about whether it's one of those spiders by the very detailed, very structured web they weave. Uh, it has, you can look at it and tell there's some design involved uh, and it's very structured. And then there's something like this, a triangulate cobweb spider. They separate out and call those cobweb spiders because cobwebs essentially are very diffuse, very unstructured webs that are spun by these spiders. And so you can tell a cobweb spider from the uh, orb weaver spiders just on the web that you see, whether the spider's there or not. This is one that you'll probably see in your garden. Triangulate because you can see these little triangles on the abdomen. And of course, the guy we have up here, if you didn't know that was a spider, you, could, you might guess that it was a crab. So it's obvious why these are called crab spiders. Just by looking at them, they very much resemble crabs. And then there's the wolf spiders here. This is one of the hunters. Uh, oftentimes you'll see these uh, in the house as well. They can be quite large and have very hairy legs. These are the ones that scare a lot of people, but these are good guys. They're nothing to worry about. So if you happen to encounter a, web, a wolf spider, remember, he's there to help. And then there's the, something like the zebra jumping spider. And these spiders really do jump. That's how they attack and subdue their prey, is as it comes by or as it flies over, they leap onto it and are able then to take down the prey. Second group of predators are the predatory mites. And predatory mites, again, they're not insects. They are related to the spiders and ticks. They're in the arachnida group. And one predatory mite will consume dozens of other mites during a, during a normal feeding during the day. Um, the predatory mites look similar to other mites, but there are a few differences. Usually they'll have a shiny, uh, unspotted, more pear-shaped body, and they'll have longer legs so they can move faster and run down their spider mite prey. Of course, as we told you earlier, when we were telling you about spider mites, those guys are very, very tiny. So these differences you'll have to observe with a hand lens because you won't be able to tell it with your naked eye. And predatory mites, as is the case with several of these beneficials that we're going to talk about, are commercially available. So you can actually buy living organisms like the predatory mites, uh, the nematodes we'll talk about later, uh, some of the insects, and release those into your garden to set up the habitat and the ecosystem of the predatory mites or the predatory uh, creatures that you want to put in there to help control the bad guys. And the predatory mites, they'll feed on all stages of spider mites, the eggs, the nymphs, the adults. And they'll also feed on eggs and immature stages of thrips, white flies, and scale insects. So the predatory mites not only feed on mites, there are some other bad guys that we have. Uh, the soft-bodied guys like the thrips, the white flies, scale insects, Predatory mites will feed on those and help to control them. And some of the adults of the predatory mites actually feed on pollen and honeydew and even fungi that's growing on your plants. So predatory mites are really good guys. Now here's some pictures of some predatory mites. And as you can see, they have a real much more rounded body than the mice that we showed you that were the bad guys. They're kind of pear-shaped, and 
I like to include under the picture of each of these mites, uh, you know, this is a really satisfying sight to see. Uh, here's a predatory mite devouring a two-spotted spider mite, and here's a predatory mite devouring the larvae of a uh, thrip. And then here's a predatory mite eating the eggs of something. I'm not sure what that is, but it's nice to see. They're in there, and they're doing their job, and they're helping us out. The next group of predators are the nematodes. Now, nematodes, you remember, those are very tiny, microscopic uh, worms. And with the nematodes, there are over 200 kinds that, uh, of soil-dwelling insects that these beneficial nematodes will feed on. And most of, most of the activity of nematodes does take place in the soil. And they feed on the larvae, the pupal stage of the insects that are in the soil. Uh, sometimes they will attack pests that are above ground, uh, but in general, they are in-ground feeders. And the nematodes, they move in the moist soil. And it's interesting that the nematodes do not wound their prey. They get into the prey by entering natural openings, like the spiracles on insects. Those are the breathing openings that the tracheal tubes are attached to. Uh, they will enter through there. They will enter through the mouths of, the in, of their prey. So they find a natural opening that they enter through. <coughs> and, <coughs> and one great thing about, or interesting thing about nematodes is they have an ally that they carry along with them. These predatory nematodes are, are almost always associated with some bacterium that's within them. And the first thing they do when they enter their host is they excrete this bacteria out into the body cavity of their prey. And the bacteria immediately starts to multiply and, and feed on the inside of the larvae, and the bacteria will end up killing the larvae, essentially they are dying of blood poisoning within a few days. And then the nematodes, they feed on those bacteria that are now in a higher population and on the degraded host tissues. So the nematode carries the bacteria into the host, releases it to start the job, and then the nematodes get the benefit of what the bacteria are doing. And the nematodes will develop and multiply within the host while it's dying and then they'll leave and go hunt for more food. <clears throat> there are quite a few different predatory nematodes out there. I just put two examples up here. These are two examples actually, uh, like I told you earlier, that are commercially available. Uh, in this picture, you can see there's the healthy white grub, and over here's a grub that the nematodes are preying on. Now the interesting thing about grubs or caterpillars when the insect, when the nematodes are in them and the bacteria is doing its job and, in, and the nematode is doing its job, they don't shrivel up and dry up the way they would if the worm just died. Uh, what usually happens is you'll see a discoloration and that's because of all the digestion and everything that's going on inside that, in this case the white grub. So it looks the same size, uh, there's not a whole lot of difference except the color. This one's been parasitized, this one hasn't. And this is the uh, Heterorhabditis bacteriophora, uh, which is a species of predatory nematode. And these are sold commercially, and they can be used to control beet armyworms, cucumber beetles, leaf miners, uh, thrips, ticks, and more insects. There's a whole list of insects that they will uh, control. Of course, ticks not being an insect, those are arachnids. And then there's the Steiner Nema. And these have been around and been studied for quite a while. This is a picture of uh, Carpocapsi, Steiner Nema Carpocapsi. And they enter the host the same way as any of the other predatory nematodes. And these can be used to control armyworms, cutworms, vine weevils, even cockroaches corn earworms, leaf miners, flea beetles, and more. And there are even predatory nematodes out there that are available for you to use to control fleas in your yard. 
So if you're having a flea problem, <clears throat> check it out because they really do work. And now we're entering one of the larger groups of predatory assistants that we have in our garden. And these are the predatory insects. Now the predatory insects, they eat uh, a lot of pest insects that are in our garden. Um, the most common predators belong to these different families. Uh, the beetle family, coleoptera, uh, true bugs, hemiptera, lacewings, neuroptera, wasps, hymenoptera, and dragonflies, odonata, and there are even uh, flies like the flower fly and the diptera. Now if you go back to your insect classification, you'll know what a, a lot of these look like then in your garden. And the predatory insect uh, larvae and adults, they'll feed on all stages of the mites and the insects. So everything from the eggs all the way up to the adults, they will be feeding on those. And some of the common insect predators, now these are in the uh, coleoptera, these are ladybird beetles. <clears throat> and there are many, many, many species of ladybird beetles. Probably everyone recognizes uh, this particular insect, though they may not know exactly which species it is, because there are quite a few of those. Uh, but they do have a general form to them. They're usually dome-shaped, and uh, they often are very colorful, as you can see these are. Uh, many have spots, though there are some who do not have spots. And they come in a different sizes, from very tiny ones, about a sixth of an inch, all the way up to ones uh, three-eighths of an inch to half an inch long. Uh, here you'll see the eggs of the ladybird beetles. Um, they all lay eggs in similar fashion, like this, in little clumps, uh, stacked up one right next to the other. And the larvae, those look like little monsters from some movie. And the, the larvae of all of the different ladybird beetles are very similar. <clears throat> have this long body, it's usually dark, they'll have some markings on it, and then up here is the business end. Those are the jaws that do all the predation and help us out a lot. <clears throat> As you can see, there are multiple colors. They can be orange, black, pink, yellow. Uh, as I said, spots may or may not be present. See, here's the spotless variety. Here's one that's just called spotted. Now this one looks a little different in the way the dome is shaped, <clears throat> but it is a ladybird beetle. And then they can even, the same species can take two different forms. Here's the two-spotted ladybird beetle, and here's the dark form where it's black with red dots, and then there's the red with black dots. And then you can see this one, the ashy gray, which is a really ashy gray color. And as I said, there are quite a few of those. There are over 350 species in North America. And the most predaceous form of the ladybird beetles are the larvae. Now, uh, adults will feed on aphids and larvae of other insects and even the eggs, but the larvae are predaceous, very voracious feeders. And they'll eat scale insects, mealybugs, aphids, Almost anything they can find that they can chew into, they will eat it. <clears throat> the second group of predatory insects are the lace wings. Uh, you might remember these are in the Neuroptera. They have these big lacy wings with lots of veins going through them. <clears throat> and in our area, in North America, there are primarily uh, three species. There's two green lace wings, two species of green lace wing, and one species of brown lace wing. Uh, you may have seen something like this on the back of your leaves in your garden. These are lacewing eggs. And if you see something like this, it's a very, very characteristic of the lacewing. They lay their eggs on a very long, thin stalk, and then at the very tip, that's the egg. So if you see something like that in your garden, be thankful, because that means you have lacewings there. And they are laid one at a time, but in groups underneath the leaf in your garden. Now these are the two green lace wings. This is the brown lace wing here. 
And with the green lace wings, it's only the larvae that feed on insect pests. The adults feed on pollen and nectar, and so they actually do some pollination. Uh, the adult green lace wings. This is a green lace wing larvae feeding on a mite right here. The brown lace wings, both the adults and the larvae, feed on insect pests. And they will feed on aphids, spider mites, white flies, thrips, leafhoppers, scale insects, mealybugs, psyllids, even small caterpillars and insect eggs. And this is a brown lace wing larvae feeding on a caterpillar here. Another group are the minute pirate bugs. And these guys, there's two different genera, and they are very tiny. But they are minute pirate bugs. They're about a quarter of an inch uh, long, uh, usually a black and white insect with various different types of markings. And the adults and larvae feed on thrips, mites, insect eggs, and virtually any kind of insect they can catch. Here we see an adult minute pirate bug. Uh, there's the little snout sticking out that they use to pierce their prey. Here's an adult feeding on a caterpillar. And here's a spider mite nymph feeding on an aphid. So just looking at this, you can tell these are really tiny guys. And then we move on to the big-eyed bugs, <clears throat> aptly named. As you can see in this picture, the most prominent feature that you notice right off the bat are the two large eyes on each side of the head. Now these are true bugs. Remember, hemiptera, with that triangle or diamond shape on their back. <clears throat> and that's what the big eye bugs belong to. And they are very important in turf grass because they are huge predators of chinch bugs. And because of their size and some similarities, they're often confused with chinch bugs. So if you see these in your lawn, make sure that you're looking at chinch bugs before you do any treatment. You might have the big-eyed bugs in there helping you out. And the, the big-eyed bugs, a lot of times you'll find them on flowers. Um, they feed on small caterpillars, mites, insect eggs and about anything they can catch. And here's another one of those nice pictures where we have the big eye bug doing its job. It's skewered a mite and preparing to devour it. Now, assassin bugs, those are interesting creatures. Um, there's quite a few different species of these uh, in the US. There's over 160 in North America. And the assassin bugs, they feed on virtually anything they can catch, a wide range of pests from tiny insects like aphids up to the larger caterpillars. And they will either stalk their prey, hunt it down, or sometimes they'll just lie and wait for something to come near and then suddenly attack it. Now, one of the reasons that they got their name assassin bug is you can see the snout here, the proboscis sticking out. You can see here on the nymph, uh, right here, that's the antenna, there's the proboscis. When they attack, often they'll stab their prey multiple times uh, in the killing process, stab it over and over and over. And so that's one of the reasons they're called assassin bugs. And with these, if you encounter an assassin bug that's a large specimen in your garden, do note that they can bite humans and have been known to. It's not dangerous, but it can be painful. If you take a close look at this assassin bug nymph and then go back and look at the leaf footed bug nymphs, what you'll find is they look very, very similar. So when you note or observe nymphs that look like this in your garden. Before you start treating for leaf-footed bugs, make sure it's not assassin bug instead. It's there to help you out. Once again, that's one of the reasons it's important to be able to identify these different insects to at least some degree. 
so you know whether you want to get rid of it or you want to keep it around. Of course, everyone has seen these guys, the praying mantis. The praying mantids, those guys are huge. Two to four inches long, and they can be either green or brown or even yellowish in color. And if you're an insect and come up upon something like that, even if it doesn't eat you, it would probably scare you to death. So these guys are very, very active, very feeders. Anything they can catch, they will eat. Not just insects. They, if they catch small fish, they will eat them. Uh, small um, lizards. They'll eat about anything that they can catch and, and grab with these huge forelegs. You see these serrations that they have on them. So once they got you, it's hard to get away. And this is something probably a lot of people have seen in their garden but didn't know what it was. You'll find these attached to stems uh, of plants in your garden. And this is the egg case of the praying mantis. So when you see that, be thankful. And it's really fun to keep your eye on it and check it every day because at some point you'll see it covered with little tiny praying mantids. It's a lot of fun. Other insect predators are the soldier beetles. And the soldier beetles, as you'll see here with the different ones, the margin soldier beetle, the goldenrod soldier beetle, small black soldier beetle, they can be different shapes and different colors, but they generally have the same form. They are coleoptera, so they have the hard outer first pair of wings that forms this straight line down their back when they're closed. And then underneath they have the membranous wings. These are often confused with lightning bugs because they have a very similar appearance. So when people see these on their plants during the day, a lot of times they'll, have, they'll think they have lightning bugs. But the soldier beetles do not have the ability to flash lights the way lightning bugs do. The larvae are covered in dark bristles. You might be able to see these. If not, uh, just look them up online. And you can see those dark bristles that stick out. Now these are the legs. And this is a very formidable head and mouth parts we have here. So it's understandable how they can be such voracious feeders. Uh, they will feed on insects. They'll feed on snails and slugs. They'll feed on millipedes. They'll even eat earthworms. Okay, earthworms are good guys, but soldier beetles, they just eat what they can find. Uh, they eat caterpillars. They'll eat maggots, which are fly larvae, insect eggs. And even though I've shown you four different species here, there are over 468 species of soldier beetles in North America. So there are a lot of them out there, a lot of guys ready to help us. Another one are the ground beetles. Once again, these are coleoptera. Most are shiny, uh, brown, black, or blue-black insects. And they range in size from one quarter inch up to over an inch long. Uh, they usually have long legs and long antennae. And they have prominent jaws. As you can see, with virtually all of these samples, especially these, very prominent jaws that they use to kill caterpillars. And this includes armyworms, cutworms, grubworms. They'll kill other insects uh, and devour them. They'll kill small snails and slugs. They are very, very good to have in the garden. Adults and larvae primarily feed at night. Now this is the larvae of a ground beetle. Here are the legs and you see, once again, very prominent mouth parts. Here's another one of those good stories. A ground beetle larvae feeding on a white grub. And there are also flies that are predatory in our garden. Uh, the diptera order. One of them are, are the hover flies, also sometimes known as surfing flies or flower flies. 
Uh, they can be from about less than a little less than half an inch long to over half an inch long. They're usually brightly colored, though some are not quite so. They're a little more drab. And they got the name hoverfly because frequently you'll find them essentially hovering over a flower. Uh, and that's what the adults feed on, the nectar and the pollen. That is their only food source. And so they are pollinators, and they will hover over the flower right before they land. They usually have large, prominent eyes, as you can see here, the way most flies do. Some of them look wasp-like. Others look bee-like. But these are true flies. They only have, as you can see here, one pair of wings, one pair of membranous wings. So that puts them into the diptera. And the larvae of almost all species will feed on aphids, scales, thrips, and other uh, small-bodied insects. This is a larvae, larva of a surfeit fly or a hoverfly, feeding on an aphid. Often the larvae of surfeit flies are confused with maggots or fly larvae that devour rotting meat and such. But they are usually usually distinguished, they'll either be clear, uh, sometimes yellow, yellowish green. And uh, so if you see these guys on your plants, uh, leave them, they're there to help you. The second category of beneficials are the parasitoids. Now the parasitoids are insects that parasitize other insects. And it's usually the immature stages, the larval forms, that are doing the parasitization. And they develop either on the outside of the host or within the host, eventually killing it. And they'll attack uh, all stages of the host, the eggs, the larvae, the nymphs, the pupae, and the adults. And the adult parasitoids, their main function is to go lay eggs in more hosts and spread their offspring around. The two major groups of parasitoids are the parasitic wasps and the tachinid flies. Now, I'm calling these parasitoids, the, linguistically, the primary dis difference between a parasitoid and a parasite. They both feed on living organisms. But the difference is, the parasite usually feeds on its host and keeps it alive. Parasitoids feed on their host and kill it. So that's how we're distinguishing um, this category of beneficials as parasitoids rather than parasites. Uh, some of the common parasitoids are, as I said, the parasitoid wasps. And most insect parasitoid wasps are very host specific. So each little wasp has a particular insect host that it lays its eggs on and no others. And the most common ones that you'll notice belong to the braconid or the ignominid group of wasps. And the reason that you might notice these, these are the larger of the parasitic wasps. Parasites. And they are still tiny as you can tell here these are both braconids. These down here are uh, the ignominid wasps. Here's a braconid wasp laying its egg onto an aphid. And we all know how tiny an aphid is. And there's a wasp, which is even smaller than the aphid, laying its egg. Here's an ignominoid laying its eggs on a caterpillar. The main difference between the braconid and the ignominid wasps is the venation on the wings. So I'm no expert. I don't try to identify these guys all the way down to their genus and species. If I can recognize these 
different guys as braconid wasps or as parasitoid wasps, I consider myself pretty good. So that's, that's really what you want to know is learn to recognize these based on their size and their look. Uh, the typical larval, the wasps typically have a larval stage and it feeds on the inside of the host insect. Uh, it's where they mature is one of the big differences. Now with this, it's a braconid wasp that has laid its eggs onto a caterpillar, this being a hornworm caterpillar. And the larvae mature inside the host and then form their pupae on the outside of the host. And so they pupate on the outside of the host. This is a aphid that was parasitized by a braconid wasp. And in this case, the wasp larvae mature and pupate inside the host. And then the adult cuts this nice round hole to create an escape hatch. And these aphid mummies you can find very frequently on your plants because with all these wasps around, a lot of times you will find the parasitized uh, host, either in this case the aphid or up there. This is a hornworm caterpillar that is being slowly eaten alive by the braconid wasp. And an adult braconid wasp can lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs, so they can be very prolific. Now, the other category are the parasitoid flies. The, the most studied, the most recognized, the most commonly talked about are the, the taconids, uh, parasitic flies. And just looking at this fact here, that there are over 1,300 different species of technic flies just in North America. So you can see that there are a lot of these guys out there. But once again, they're very small. Uh, flies that can be a third of an inch to three quarters of an inch long. And the majority are endoparasites. Essentially, the developing larvae will feed on the inside of their host, not from the outside. These are pictures of a couple of different taconid flies. You can see this one almost looks like a wasp hanging out on the flower because the taconids do eat nectar and pollen. Here's a caterpillar being parasitized by the taconids. It's got two eggs on it. Here's a caterpillar with multiple eggs laid on it. And it's really interesting how the taconid fly gets its eggs inside its host. It uses multiple approaches. Uh, some taconid species, they'll lay their eggs on the leaves. And then when the caterpillar comes along and eats that particular section of the leaf with the eggs on it, it swallows the eggs, then the eggs hatch inside, and the larvae begin to feed and kill the host. Others will uh, insert, insert their eggs or lay their eggs directly into the host. So they'll land on the caterpillar and lay the eggs inside the body of the host. And others will actually attach their eggs to the outside of the host. And if the eggs are sticking on the outside, uh, once the larvae hatches, it bores its way inside the body of the host and begins to devour it from the inside out. And the third category of beneficial that we're going to talk about, and we're going to keep this just to the insects, are the pollinators. And the pollinators include honeybees, leafcutter bees, all kinds of wild bees, butterflies, moths, and various other insects that uh, land on flowers to feed on the nectar and the pollen. Now, remember, we've already mentioned some of those in the adults of the predatory insects, such as the hoverfly, and uh, others that we talked about. 
And some common insect pollinators we're going to go through now, uh, bees. They are the most important and the most efficient pollinators that we have. And the bees rely solely on the protein and carbohydrates found in the pollen and the nectar of flowers as their food source. And as they travel, what, the way they pollinate is as, as they travel in search of food, the pollen sticks to the very fine short hairs that cover the insect's body, and then it's transferred uh, within flower or from flower to flower as they move around collecting pollen and nectar. In North America, there are over 5,000 species of native, bee, native bees, and 90% of these are solitary bees, so they don't live in colonies. They're not social bees. And bees are unique in that they are the only insects that actively gather large amounts of pollen to feed themselves and their, uh, their young. Now, honeybees, one of the main pollinators that everyone's heard of, they actually are not native to North America. They were introduced to around the 1600s. And honeybees can forage up to five miles in search of nectar and pollen. And they are very, very effective pollinators. Uh, that's why a lot of these are used and rented commercially to pollinate a lot of our fruits and vegetables. Here's some uh, honeybees you see feeding and collecting nectar and pollen from the flowers. And here are the pollen sacks on the legs of honeybees that they stuff full of pollen to take back with them. There are two different types of carpenter bees, large carpenter bees and small carpenter bees. They all bore their way into wood or soft pithy stems and that's where they have their eggs and their larvae develop, so aptly named carpenter bees. And their primary food is pollen and nectar. Uh, these are two of the small carpenter bees. Uh, and these are two of the large carpenter bees, this being the eastern carpenter bee and this being the southern carpenter bee. Uh, one way you can tell carpenter bees from bumblebees that we'll talk about later is the carpenter bee has a smooth abdomen with no hairs and as you'll see shortly the bumblebee has a hairy abdomen and here they are the bumblebees they can be anywhere from three quarters of an inch up to an inch and a half long they feed on pollen and nectar they also have uh, pollen baskets that they will fill with pollen and they have the hairy abdomen. As you can see on these different ones, the yellow banded bumblebee, uh, the brown belted bumblebee, the American bumblebee, there's the hairy abdomen, and the eastern bumblebee. So bumblebees can sting, but they aren't very aggressive, but you can tell those from the carpenter bees because of the hairy abdomen. So if you see something that looks like a bumblebee buzzing around and it has a hairy abdomen, then it is a bumblebee. Another group of pollinators are the sweat bees. These guys are actually pretty small. They're only less than half an inch in size. You'll often see these on flowers, collecting nectar and pollen. And they will collect nectar and pollen to take back to their home, and that's what they use as food for their young. They'll usually store up some pollen and nectar, and a lot of times they'll make balls out of it, and lay the egg on the ball of pollen, and then leave the egg in the larvae to hatch and develop on its own. They're important pollinators, especially of wildflowers and some of our other crops. Um, they're called sweat bees because oftentimes they will go in search of salts as part of their diet. And of course, when you sweat, that is salty. And so they're attracted to that salt. And that's why they're called sweat bees. Leaf cutting bees, that's, those are other pollinators. Many of you may have seen, especially on roses in our area, some other plants, you'll see leaves on your plants that look like someone took a hole punch and made holes all through the leaves because they make a very, very symmetrical circular hole on the leaf or uh, 
circular cutout of the leaf. And that's what the leaf, cutter, leaf cutter bees use to form their nests and, in the cells and to pack the cells. And what they'll do is uh, they usually have long tube-like homes. They'll lay an egg, pack it in there with uh, pollen balls, pollen and nectar packed inside with the egg, and then they'll cover that over with leaf tissue and then lay another egg on top of that. And so there will be several cells that they'll build up along the tubular shaped nests that they have. And they're very important pollinators for our wildflowers, for fruits, and, and for vegetables. Here we have a leaf cutter bee visiting a flower just like we have up here, collecting pollen, collecting nectar. Uh, other the other uh, common pollinators now are the wasps. The wasps are different from bees. Uh, they are beneficial predators of insect pests as well. I uh, don't think we mentioned those earlier, but wasps actually collect caterpillars and flies and feed on caterpillars and flies. Uh, they'll sting the caterpillars to kill them, and then they will use those uh, as food. But they also feed on nectar and pollen. It's kind of like a quick energy burst they get. And when they're feeding on that, then even though they're not as hairy as some of the others, as the bees that we just talked about, pollen will still tick, stick to their bodies. And as they go from plant to plant, they're transferring that pollen. Here are a couple of different types of wasps, the mason wasps and the potter wasps. Uh, potter wasps use mud to form their homes. This is a potter wasp up here. Uh, the mason wasps uh, will often use uh, vegetative matter that they chewed up and mix that together to make their uh, burrows out of uh, or their nests. And you can actually put homes up for the mason wasps. They like to live in uh, old tubes they find, and that's a mason wasp house right there. And the adults do feed on the pollen and nectin, nectar, and the young of the, or the adults of the mason wasps and potter wasps uh, feed on lepidopteran caterpillars. And they'll actually take those back uh, for their young. As I said earlier, they sting them and take them away to feed to their developing young. So they are not only beneficial as being predatory, but they're also beneficial as being pollinators. Paper wasps. I'm sure a lot of us have seen these at some point in our life, and usually with not a good story to tell about it. Uh, here we have the red paper wasp. Up here, the European paper wasp has the black and yellow stripes. And often you will see these flying around your plants. They are pollinators. The adults feed on caterpillars and other adult insects, but they also feed on nectar. And so they're going to visit the flowers, and when they do, their bodies get covered with pollen. As they move from flower to flower, they do pollinate. So paper wasps are good in two different ways. They are predators and they are pollinators. Now we move to the group that probably everyone has heard about and everyone loves and has seen so many of them, the butterflies. Now they're in Butterflies, there are about 17,500 species of butterflies in the world, and in the U.S. there are about 750 different species of butterflies. Butterflies have really good vision, so the brighter colors you have in your garden, the more butterflies you're going to have. They are drawn to those bright flowers. They, they can see red, unlike bees. Bees can't see red, so they aren't drawn to red. Butterflies can see red. The reds and oranges really attract butterflies. And a lot of our wild uh, native plants rely on butterflies uh, for pollination because the butterflies use those uh, to get their nectar. And uh, a lot of the host plants that the larvae live on are native or wild plants, wildflowers. Butterflies are attracted to larger flat petaled flowers as well. It gives them some place to land. It makes it easier for them to feed. Now if you ever watch a butterfly feed, you'll notice it lands, it feeds on the flower, 
It extends its proboscis or its feeding tube, which they can siphon up the nectar through, and their body actually never really touches the flower much at all. But as they fly in and fly away, their wings are brushing the, the flowers, knocking the pollen loose, and especially if they're hanging on a flower upside down, it will collect on their bodies and on their wings. And as they visit other flowers, they will pollinate. Here are some uh, beautiful and commonly seen butterflies that we have. Uh, the monarch, of course, everyone knows about the monarch. Uh, that's probably the most studied butterfly, maybe the most studied insect in uh, classrooms nowadays. Uh, it's used for a lot of different uh, lessons. Um, beautiful, beautiful butterflies. Uh, then, of course, there's the sulfur butterflies like this, the cloudless sulfur. Uh, swallowtails, so named because of these protuberances at the end of each wing. We have the eastern tiger swallowtail here, the black swallowtail here. Uh, along with the uh, sulfurs, there's the whites, just such as this one, the cabbage white, uh, which its larvae is garden pest. A lot of these lepidopteran insects, as you'll remember, including the butterflies, their larvae are pests on our plants. Here's the admiral, red admiral, the admirals. Uh, there's the brush-footed butterflies, like the Gulf fritillary. Uh, here's another swallowtail over here. This one is not as commonly seen. It's beautiful blue pipe vine swallowtail. Uh, the skippers, uh, this is the long-tailed skipper. You can see it does have these long extensions on its wings. And then over here is the small skipper. Uh, so there are quite a few butterflies that everyone's familiar with. These are your good guys. These are pollinators. Uh, as adults, as larvae, they can sometimes be pests. So they can be good guys or bad guys, depending how you want to look at them. Uh, the interesting thing to me is the next group of pollinators we're going to talk about are the moths. Now, a lot of people are familiar with butterflies. They see butterflies. They know there are a lot of butterflies out there. And uh, think how beautiful they are and how many there are. But they're actually, look at the difference in the number of moths that we have compared to the number of butterflies. In the world, there are over 160,000 species of moths compared to only 17,500 species of butterflies. And in the US, remember we had 750 species of butterflies? We have nearly 11,000 species of moths. So why is it that butterflies are so much more noticed than moths? Well, one reason is moths, when it comes to pollinating those in the late afternoon or evening blooming plants, that's where your moths are. A lot of moths, the majority of moths are nocturnal. So they are active in the early evening or in the nighttime. There are some moths that uh, are active during the day. These are diurnal moths, but the majority of moths are active at dusk or at night. And so that's one reason why we don't see or are as familiar with the moths as we are with the butterflies. And like the butterfly, when they're feeding, they aren't in direct contact with the flower, but once again, their wings brush the Flower causes pollen to fall off, it sticks to their bodies, sticks to their wings, and so they do transfer pollen from one flower to the next. Here are some uh, moths that are really unique. Uh, why I put these guys up here. This is the Luna moth, and these you don't see very often, but this guy is huge, larger than your hand. So uh, it's a beautiful butterfly um, or moth and a very large moth. Uh, over here is the uh, common buckeye, as you can see how it got its name. It's also a pretty large moth. And then there are the sphinx moths. Uh, hummingbird moth is, is in that category, but as you can see how it got its name, the hummingbird moth. It has this long proboscis that it's feeding, and it just buzzes outside of the flower, collecting nectar. And if you see these, you may be uh, confused and think that you are actually observing 
hummingbirds because they look very much like hummingbirds. They're about the size of a hummingbird. So when you see these buzzing, the way they fly, the way they feed, the way they look, they look a lot like a hummingbird. But if you're seeing something like that at dusk or in the evening, then you're seeing the hummingbird moth because hummingbirds are active during the day. Here's some other sphinx moths, the uh, white line sphinx moth and the Carolina sphinx moth. These are all both very large and very gorgeous moths. And then there are these other moths that do a lot of mimicking. Like here is the narrow-boarded bee moth. And you can see how it got its name. These you can actually see buzzing around sometimes during the day. Uh, it looks like a bee. So when you see these guys, they're trying to look like bees. It's kind of a way of protecting themselves from predation. And then there are some, uh, these guys, uh, like the peach tree borer moth, they are pollinators, but they're also uh, some of our pests. Any of the borers will actually cause a lot of damage to our uh, trees, and especially our fruit trees. And if you just saw this guy sitting on a plant, you would probably think you were looking at a wasp. But uh, by looking at the antennae, and the wings, you could tell that this actually is a moth, that one being a peach tree borer moth. Now, some other pollinators, as I mentioned earlier, are flies. Uh, flies can transport a lot of pollen at one time. And it's when they're in feeding and collecting nectar is when the flies are getting covered with pollen. Now, flies, remember, their mouth parts they generally have sponging mouth parts. Uh, and so that sponging proboscis that they have, it can uh, vary in length, but it's usually not very long. And so that limits the types of flowers that flies can actually pollinate. Uh, they're usually very open flowers, very accessible uh, to the nectar. And these are the fl flowers that flies uh, pollinate. There are some fl flowers that flies are drawn to, uh, members of the umbiliferae family, like the carrots, the parsley, uh, the brassicas, the brassicaceae, like mustards, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, the cold crops, rosaceae, strawberry, raspberry, blackberry, and the aliaceae, like lemon, uh, onions, and leeks, and chives. These are often pollinated by flies, and these also are usually unattractive to bees. And so if it wasn't for the flies pollinating, these flowers wouldn't get pollinated. And there is a unique type of flower that is only pollinated by the flies. And these are flowers that when they open, the fragrance they give off is like uh, it's a very putrid odor like rotting meat or uh, dead animals. It can even smell like manure uh, or even like blood. And these flowers are pollinated by flies. And that's the reason they're giving off this odor is because they want to attract their pollinators. Here are some common uh, flies that are pollinators. Uh, the blowfly, that one is notorious for uh, what it does with our animals, but it is a pollinator. Remember the taconid fly that we talked about earlier, who's a predator, it's also a pollinator. Uh, the surfid fly, also one of our beneficials as a predator, is also a pollinator. The bee fly, so named because it has a very much resemblance to a bee, it's also a pollinator, example of one. Uh, this hairy leg fly looks a lot like a wasp, but it is a fly, it's a pollinator. And then I put this one up here because it's very interesting. Uh, midges, midges are flies, and this is the chocolate midge. So for all of us chocolate lovers in the world, we are relying on the chocolate midge to pollinate the flowers of the chocolate tree or the cocoa tree. And that is where we get the chocolate from. And we need those chocolate midges uh, to keep it coming. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna, who is going to tell you something about how you can keep these pollinators alive and active in your own garden. Hi, class. Next, we're going to talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is a little bit about pollinator gardening. And we'll touch more on some of these topics later in the class, including native plants. So what can we do to make our backyards and our gardens more pollinator friendly? There are several steps that we can do, and if you're growing vegetables, your vegetable plants will definitely benefit. Joe talked about a lot of good pollinators, but also a lot of good predators that help control pests naturally in your yard and garden. So creating habitat is a good way to ensure that you have those good guys on your side. First and foremost, you need to provide sources of food year round. That can be done by planting native flowers, and again, we'll have a lecture about that in a few weeks, um, that bloom in the spring, summer, fall, and here in New Orleans in the winter too. So having a year long continuous source of blooming plants that provide pollen and nectar sources is always a good idea. Let's talk about lawns. That's kind of the elephant in the room. Our grass lawns may look beautiful, but they have very little wildlife value. They're basically food deserts for insects, birds, and other animals. So it's a good idea to minimize your lawn footprint by maybe expanding some perennial beds or planting some wildflowers. That's always a good idea. Um, ditch the lawn. <laughs> Um, it's also a good idea to delay mowing. You might be in a schedule where you're mowing maybe every other week or maybe every week. It's best to let that lawn get a little long and tall and don't control those weeds. You know, weeds are just a plant out of place, but many of our more common lawn weeds are indeed native plants, or even if they're not native, they do provide some wildlife benefit, especially to insects. Um, the Dutch white clover is a really good example of that. So learn to live with a little bit of a weedy area in your lawn maybe, um, some diversity. And we always say if it's green and you can mow it to three inches, it's good to go. The second strategy would be to provide some nesting sites. Um, it's a good idea to maintain some areas that are bare in your garden, um, that maybe have some more cover, well-drained soil. And that's because there are a lot of ground nesting species of bees. These are solitary bee species that dig a little hole in the ground, in the soil, and that's where they raise their brood. Um, they don't provide the brood with a, a honeycomb or a hive, per se, like we think of with the honeybees. These are ground nesting bees. So I like providing that kind of space along a fence. Um, I have this in my backyard. I don't have mulch in those areas, and it's a good place for those queen bees to lay their brood. Some bees also need mud for nest building. Um, we've all seen on the underside of our roofs or our, our porches, sometimes there's wasps or bee species that provide a little kind of mud tube or nest for their, for their young. Um, so if you have a wet, low area with a muddy area, that can be a good thing as well. Um, you can make or buy nesting houses also, and I do have a slide coming up with some examples of those. Third, protect pollinators from pesticides. Now, even if you're an organic gardener, chances are pretty good you're gonna be spraying something like neem oil or insecticidal soap, spinosad on a regular basis. It's best to use those products in the early evening or the early morning before pollinators are out and foraging for the day. Personally, I like spraying in the early evening because I know all the pollinators are back at their hives or where they're spending the night. They're not out foraging for pollen and nectar. And then that product that I apply has many hours, you know, eight to 10 hours overnight to dry or be absorbed by the plant. Okay, let's talk a little bit more in depth about providing food. The Ag Center and a lot of other nonprofit research-based sources of information have lists of plants that are helpful for pollinators. This is a list that comes straight out of the Conserving Urban Pollinators fact sheet that we have from the LSU Ag Center. And what it is, is a list of a number of different wildflower species, their bloom time, and what kind of insect pollinator they benefit. Each state has a resource like this, and it can be really handy when you're planning your garden. It's a good idea to even dedicate a section of your yard or even a corner of your vegetable garden to these flowering species. 
What that does is it draws those beneficial insects into your garden in close proximity so that they can do their job. Native plants and heirlooms are truly best, and you want to look for true native plants and not native ours, which are cultivated forms of native plants, and we're going to cover that more in depth in a couple of weeks. New hybrids are pretty low in pollen content. Many flowers have been bred for bigger, showier, more colorful blooms, and not so much for their pollinator value. So do shop for those older cottage heirloom varieties or true native plants. An interesting fact is here in New Orleans and different parts of the Gulf South, sometimes up to 70 to 90 percent of the pollen that bees are foraging in deep summer, right now in July, August, are coming from crepe myrtles, which are indeed not a native plant, but they do have some wildlife value. That's just an interesting aside, and I think Dr. Joe mentioned that earlier in this lecture. Providing shelter can be a really neat kind of um, crafty thing to do in your garden. I have three of these bee hotels, and you can buy or you can make these. There's a lot of instructions online about how to do it properly. Um, and you do want to leave some bare ground in your garden. Check it out. This is a bee nesting in a hole in the ground. And many of our native bee species rely on that as a strategy for raising their brood. So have a little area dedicated to bare ground in your garden. It's a good idea to provide some woody habitat for wood nesting bees. Roughly 30% of our native bees will nest in little cavities in wood. Um, these bee hotels usually provide blocks of wood or logs with holes drilled in them. Um, this one uses bamboo. And I've seen a lot of the mason wasps utilizing this at my house. It really is neat watching them at work. Mulch in the garden can be both good and bad. It can help protect the soil, and it provides habitat for a lot of small arthropods, a lot of insects. Um, however, it does prevent ground nesting bees from nesting, so set aside an area for them. Reserve some areas, too, in your garden for dead woody material. We all like to get out there, especially in the fall and spring, and do a big cleanup in our yard. All those branches and dead stems and twigs may actually be harboring overwintering insects, particularly a lot of moth cocoons, um, cavity nesting bee larvae. That's your next generation of pollinators and beneficial insects for the following summer. So when you do a big yard cleanup, it's best to stack those materials in an unused corner of your yard and let those little critters hatch out, pupate, and repopulate the yard maybe a few months later. So don't just you know, shred them, throw them away, chip them up, or burn them, because that's habitat, and that's future generations of beneficial insects that you may be harming. Providing water is very important, especially during the summer months. Um, in my yard, I have a couple of these dishes of marbles as a bee watering system. Um, this is one that utilizes corks, but what you want is a shallow dish that's not too steep and slick for the bees or other insects to get in there and drown. So what's nice about the marbles and the corks is it provides a landing space and so a way for them to get up out of the water while still taking advantage of it. Um, these little bee waterers are a really good thing to do with kids, and they can attract an awful lot of insects, including butterflies. You do want to avoid pesticide use in the garden as much as possible if you're interested in beneficial insects. Now, that's not to say never use pesticides ever, but more do it strategically. Only when you observe a pest or the threshold of that pest damage is just too much where you have to get out and spray and do some kind of management. Um, bees do feed their pollen to their brood, and a lot of insecticides can be concentrated in the pollen um, especially systemic products like imidacloprid. So that's part of why those products are not recommended in areas that bees are foraging or for use on flowering plants. Ten-foot rule is a good one to keep in mind. Don't apply pesticides in your garden if there are bees and other insects foraging within ten feet. That's why spraying in the early evening or the very early morning is best. When we do spray, our pollinators or our beneficials, a few different things can go wrong. They can experience compromised health immunity, a shortened lifespan, 
Impaired memory, so for example, honeybees that are impacted by neonicotinoids, they have a shorter memory or they have trouble getting back to their hive sometimes. Um, there can be delayed larval development and gut microbe dis disruption. So we do want to avoid spraying pesticides directly on bees or in areas where they're foraging. We're gonna include this, but this is a really great list of resources for home gardeners if you're interested in exploring pollinators and beneficial insects more. These are some that I really love, and at my home garden, I've actually gone through the process of getting it certified as a wildlife habitat through the National Wildlife Federation, um, a pollinator byway through the Green Bridges product, project, and a certified monarch way station. So those are three really good programs if you're interested in beneficial insects and wildlife in your garden that you can choose to pursue and they give you a nice little sign for out in your garden as well. Um, some of these resources are very local, um, but I'm sure each state, each country will have something similar. Don't forget to post your questions and your lab results to the discussion board. Remember, again, this is optional, but we do have two labs that are going to be a lot of fun coming up for you this week.